Right, welcome back. Uh, with our next speaker, Nicolas Perez Nieves, which I probably mispronounced terribly. He's from Imperial and actually works with Dan Goodman, and he will talk about understanding the role of neural heterogeneity in learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers. So I'm going to talk about the role of neural heterogeneity uh, in learning. So um, to begin with, so the, the question that we try to answer is why is the brain so heterogeneous? So here you can see, for instance, um, some, some data, some uh, membrane time constants that I took from the neuroelectro.org uh, webpage. You can see these are all recordings from over 370 publications uh, where they, they measure experimentally 87 different neuron types. And you can see that the membrane time constants vary from 25 milliseconds up to 200 milliseconds. And something that is constant on all these, uh, um, on all these experiments is that uh, many parameters, morphologies, etc., are heterogeneous, and the brain seems in general to be heterogeneous. So the question is, why is the brain heterogeneous? And the several hypotheses could be, is there some functional role to this heterogeneity? Um, it could be it's just a byproduct of noisy developmental processes, or it could be that it's just the result of some, some contingent uh, evolutionary history. Um, it could also be some sort of combination of all of them. Um, so we try to answer this question, and in particularly, uh, I'm going to now do a, a brief summary of, of all that I'm going to, to talk about. Um, and basically, what we have done in, in order to, to try to answer this question is, is train spiking neural networks on difficult real-world tasks, and, and where we allow the neurons to learn its time constants. And also, we tried what happens if we initialize them in a heterogeneous way. So the results that we had were the following three. The heterogeneity helps in tasks with complex temporal structure. That uh, there is an optimal distribution that is found very consistently of time constants that matches experimental data, and that heterogeneity gives uh, robustness to hyperparameter mistuning. So in, the conclusion uh, of, of the work would be that heterogeneity seems to be an efficient way to improve performance at a low computational cost. So how have we done this? So well, what we have done in, in all of our experiments is uh, simple uh, leaky integrifier, uh, integrifier recurrent um, neural networks in which we have some input spikes, some recurrent layer, which usually we, we, we have few neurons uh, because it's very computationally expensive, so around 128 neurons. And then we were recording the membrane potentials of the outputs. And we make a, predi a prediction uh, with these membrane potentials and we back propagate. Uh, using surrogate gradient descent. So we train in four different regimes, and the four regimes are the ones shown here, and, and throughout the presentation, I'm gonna follow this color scheme for them. So the baseline would be this uh, homogeneous initialization and standard training regime, in which all the neurons are the same, all the neurons have the same parameters, and we only train the weights. Uh, we can also either uh, initialize them heterogeneously, so the neurons have different time constants, and then train the weights, or train both the weights and the time constants of the neurons. And of course, we can do both things, so we initialize them heterogeneously and train both the weights and the time constants. So these are the four uh, setups in which we have done the training. And the data set that we have used to, to, to uh, investigate this are data sets in which we try to increase the temporal structure that the data set has. So on the left here, we have data sets with, with uh, lower temporal structures, so that will be something like the neuromorphic MNIST and the fashion MNIST, in which by adding all the spikes uh, across the temporal dimension, you can pretty much tell what you're looking at. Um, and this, in this case will be a zero. So, so the temporal information is not so relevant. And something similar happens from the fashion MNIS where we encoded each of the pixel intensities as, as latencies, as spike latencies. Some of the data sets like the DVS 128, uh, we have actually some temporal information that we require in order to be able to classify. But still some of the samples are, it's enough to just see uh, a sum of all the spikes in order to tell whether uh, it's in one class or the other. And finally, we have the SHD and the SSC data sets, uh, which are uh, almost purely uh, or fundamentally or highly uh, temporal uh, in their nature. And these data sets are based on uh, spoken digits and spoken uh, commands, which have been converted into spike times using a very uh, detailed model of the cochlear nucleus. Um, so. The results that we obtain when training this kind of network on these data sets are the following. So the baseline would be here in blue. Um, and, and as we go down here, we, we would be increasing the level of heterogeneity that we allow for. So with the neuromorphic MNIST, we see that there is basically no improvement at all by adding heterogeneity of any of these kinds. As, uh, however, for the more 
uh, temporarily uh, relevant or temporarily complex data sets, we see that any uh, heterogeneity that we add seems to be increasing the testing uh, accuracy. And this can be seen here again. The fashion M, this is a strange case in which it seems that only the heterogeneous cases seem to get this 88%, uh, 87% performance. And I'll talk a bit about it uh, later on, on why this, this is happening. So, so we, we have seen that it seems so far that uh, using this heterogeneity seems to improve the performance. Um, but now what we wanted to, to look at is what happens with the time constants that we have trained. So here on the left, you can see the distribution of time constants, either in orange, the heterogeneous initialization, and in blue, the homogeneous one. And these ones were, after training in each of these data sets, uh, converted in the, into these new distributions. And we can find that pretty much uh, all of them follow this distribution in which uh, most of the weight is concentrated at the lower uh, time constants. And, and some of them, particularly the ones that have more temporal information, seem to have more uh, um, weight uh, also added into the into the time constants that are really large. And interestingly, uh, we looked at some experimental data. So that would be data from the Paul Manis data set uh, um, recordings and from the Allen Institute. And we found that this distribution resemble uh, actual experimental distributions. Um, and uh, interestingly, these distributions didn't have any large uh, uh, time constants. And we believe that the, the reason why we see these large time constants is because our networks are small. So some of the networks, uh, some of the neurons are needed to be really large in, in memory. They need to have a, a long time constant so that they can remember uh, um, information for longer time. But if you had a, a larger network, this wouldn't uh, appear. Um, and this was not, not only consistent across uh, data sets, but also across different initializations. So we tried uh, initializing it at really large time constants or with a Gaussian distribution or with a uniform distribution. And in the uh, this is the SHD data set. Um, we found that the distributions are pretty much identical in all cases. So, so this seems to be uh, the optimal uh, distribution for, for training uh, and learning in this task. Um, we also tried to see what happens if we augment the, the data set. So the original data set would, would look like this. It will take about 0.8 uh, uh, seconds for, for the whole um, um, sample. But what, what we do is uh, scale it so that uh, either we compress the spike times or, or we extend the relative spike times. And we now have inputs that can have these different scales factors and what we do it now is we train the network on uh, um, by drawing this scale factor from this uh, log normal distribution which is the same distribution as the human syllabic rate so that the network will uh, see samples that have a probability given by this distribution of being of each of the scale factors and then what we will do is test on on never seen samples at all these uh, scale factors time scale factors, how the network performs, and this would be the, the result of that. And what we see is that um, the baseline is, is much worse at, at uh, being able to, or relatively uh, worse at, at uh, uh, predicting what the output is going to be for really large time scales that it has never seen. And the others uh, seem to perform better. And very interestingly, the heterogeneous initialization without the heterogeneous training uh, manages to keep up with the performance of the other two, the ones that are actually training the, the time constants, which would give you some hint of why perhaps a, a, a system would evolve to, to have some heterogeneous time constants, as it seems that it, it has a better generalization against uh, timescale factors that in, in your lifetime you see uh, less often. Um, we did something similar, but kind of the, the, the reciprocal of this. So uh, we have the hyperparameters uh, properly set for a timescale of one. And we train the, in this case, we only train the weights. Uh, we don't train the time constants. And we did this uh, uh, so that um, um, we have a homogeneous distribution of the time constants and heterogeneous distribution of the time constants and an intermediate distribution. And the intermediate one is uh, basically two homogeneous at two different time scales, one large and one small. So what we find is that this uh, um, homogeneous distribution actually training the weights at a scale factors of four when the hyperparameters uh, were, were set for, for one uh, is really bad at generalizing. And the heterogeneous, however, is pretty much flat at all the time scales, although the hyperparameters were set for one. And in, the intermediate one is in between, as you would probably uh, expect. So 
uh, I, I was going to talk also about the, the hyperparameter uh, mistuning that, that uh, I, I pretty much uh, skipped before. So basically, what we're seeing in the fashion MNIST, fashion MNIST uh, was, was trained uh, with using the hyperparameters for the SHT. And what we found is that the heterogeneous initializations would prevent you from having these uh, issues where some of the uh, some of the seeds would basically get stuck in local minima, and it would take much longer for them to, to get out of that and, and properly train. Um, so, so it seems that if your hyperparameters are mistuned, having some heterogeneous initialization would allow you to train the network in a much more smoother way. And this is something that we also uh, tested on a different training uh, method. So this will be with force training. Uh, in force training, instead of trying to classify some data, uh, what you do is you, you try for your network to memorize, and then you uh, ask it to retrieve uh, some high dimensional data. In this case, it would be this uh, spectrogram. So um, the, the, the network will try to memorize what this spectrogram is, and then you would ask it, uh, can you give me this spectrogram? Can I reconstruct it? Um, and we, again, we tune it for 1,000 uh, neurons. Um, the, the learning of this spectrogram. And then we vary the number of neurons that we had uh, with different initializations. Uh, so again, this would be the homogeneous, gamma will be the heterogeneous, and that will be the, the intermediate as, as before. Um, and what we find is that the pretty much at some point, the homogeneous one breaks and it just provides, it just gives this, this highly bursting uh, and, and saturated activity and nothing can be retrieved. However, for the um, homogeneous, uh, heterogeneous one, the gamma particularly, you still have some nice activity and the uh, spectrogram can be perfectly well recovered. Um, so why does this happen? So we looked at, at the um, at the islands or, or the areas of, of stability of the network when training uh, with these distributions as we varied the hyperparameters that we had uh, uh, fitted for varying number of neurons. Uh, what we find is that is that the gamma distribution is much better uh, and is much more stable. So so blue in this case is good. So the error is low. It's it's much more stable regardless of what hyperparameters you put. Uh, neurons, as opposed to the um, the other uh, and particularly the homogeneous one, in which case this area is much smaller and you require parameters that are uh, a lot more fine-tuned in order to be able to to uh, perform in the same way. So um, as a as a summary of of uh, the whole thing that uh, that I just presented, so the, the conclusion would be that the heterogeneity is computationally efficient. Um, we have seen that it has increased the performance, is particularly in the temporarily constrained um, uh, data sets, uh, for a very small increase in the in computation. Um, the training uh, adding more or learning the time constants only grows uh, linearly with the number of of neurons that you have. Uh, however learning the more weights uh, would uh, grow uh, uh, quadratically with the number of neurons that you have. Heterogeneity also provides robustness to hyperparameter mistuning. So I, uh, we have shown that the training can be smoother and it also is better prepared to adapt to unseen uh, timescales. Uh, and, and finally, there is some open questions. So one of the main questions would be, does the brain optimize for this or this is something that uh, it's it's uh, innate uh, to a certain extent. Um, and the second question will be, do other forms of heterogeneity matter as much? So we have only trained the, the time constants, not the, uh, we haven't provided any any input as to whether we have neurons that are excitatory, others are inhibitory, different neuron types or anything like that. So all the neurons are the same, but uh, for their time, their time constants and, and weights. And finally, if you want to, to find out more, um, you can look at our recent publication. Um, that uh, yeah, and thank you very much, uh, everyone, for listening, and to all my uh, co-authors. Thank you so much for this nice talk. So there's a bunch of questions. Um, first one is uh, by Tim uh, Maskevi, which is, um, did I get it right that you use a single pool of recurrently connected neurons, no layers? In a layered network, we observed that learning one times one constant uh, time scale uh, per layer and not by neuron was usually enough. Have you tried this? Um, we tried. So so yes, we only had one layer, uh, one recurrent layer, um, and we learned the individual time constants for each of the neurons. We also tried just learning a single global time constant for the whole layer. 
and that seemed to be much worse uh, in performance. Actually, it would get stuck in local minima. We also tried uh, having several layers and learning all the time constants on those layers. And I think we only put like two or something like that. And we didn't find pretty much any performance improvement. What we didn't try was learning a single time constant per layer, which I think that's the what the question was was asking. And so yeah, certainly it could be that 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 would be key and 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 much better because then you only need to learn one parameter per layer, uh, except um, not one parameter per neuron. Right. Great. So then uh, there's a question by Camilo uh, Ortiz. Uh, would you say that a heterogene a heterogeneous uh, SNN displays temporal and time scale invariance similar to how a CNN has translational invariance? Um, I guess that to a certain extent you could say that, uh, but but I don't think it would be as accurate. So so in a convolutional neural network, you are basically forcing that by making sure that the filter is shared among uh, different uh, neurons uh, on the same uh, depth. Uh, on the same um, channel or filter. Um, but in our case, I think pretty much what's happening is that you are able to, to very, better select that some neurons react faster to the inputs and some others react slower to other inputs. So um, I don't know if that, that would be invariance. Uh, I really don't know what that would be called, uh, actually. Um, I, I guess that it's just variable memory or, or something like that, perhaps. Right. Yeah, I guess a recurrent neural network is already invariant in time, right? Translation invariant, so you already have that. But yeah. Good. Um, so the next question is, um, this is my question actually. Great. So I get to ask my question. <laughs> it looks like you get different time scale distributions for the SHD and the SSC data set. But given that they're both generated with the same conversion model, I'm I wondered whether you wondered where this comes from. Yeah, so so we don't know about that. So so it was rather surprising that the SSC data set is, is a lot harder, I'd say, to train. Um, it's longer, it has uh, more classes, uh, longer in, in, in the time window. And and I was expecting actually that the time constants, the longer time constants uh, that you need to find are uh, are more. So So you would expect to be more heavy tailed. Um, but we found pretty much the opposite, that the SHD required uh, more longer time constants. And maybe what's happening, and is, this is just a guess, uh, maybe what's happening is that in, when you train the SSC, um, it, it manages to, to distinguish enough classes by just taking information from smaller windows, and it doesn't really get uh, into the larger picture because it may be uh, too hard and there is it just gets stuck in a local minima. Uh, there is definitely a lot more to learn uh, from that data set uh, in any case because it's only 60% our best accuracy and some other people have managed to, to improve in that. But yeah, I'd say that there is something like that going on that it doesn't really manage to, to, to look into the really longer uh, time correlations that there may be on the data. Okay, interesting. There's also the point that it's much noisier. So the underlying audio data set is actually much noisier. So uh, maybe uh, some idea for some thing to look into in the future. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, so another question by Karim. Um, does the distribution depend on the input form, like using Poisson uh, spike trains instead of latency? So I think that it may it, it could be the case. So, so for instance, the fashion MNIST uh, is, is just uh, using a very small number of spikes. So every every input neuron only spikes once. Um, what that means is that everything happens very quickly and very soon uh, you don't have any spikes. The number of times that you have is very small. So the result of that is that most of the distribution is, is concentrated at very, very small time constants. So if you were to use a, a Poisson input to encode that, uh, I would think, uh, instead of using the, the latency, I, I, I would expect to have some longer time constants in that case, because you need to be able to, to remember um, more spikes in order to, to be able to tell what's the, frequen where the frequency of, of, of that pixel. So yes, I think it definitely uh, affects the, the kind of encoding that, that you have. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good. Um, so the next question is by Gregor Lenz. Uh, it's a Bit of a technical question. Um, in your paper, you say that you're training 
um, x of minus 1 over tau rather than tau itself. Why did you do that? And does this not also skew the learn distribution? Yeah, um, um, so, so the reason why we do that is because uh, pretty much for numerical uh, stability. So I think in a previous talk by Henning Spreckler, they, they were saying something that the training the time constants were very tricky. And I think they were training them directly, um, which has this uh, inversion and then exponentiation, which can make things numerically very unstable. And I think they tried to do uh, the inverse, which was a bit better, but it still was giving uh, some, some trouble. Um, and I know some other people have tried to to uh, um, train them directly and have succeeded. So it's by no means impossible. Um, it could be that that the fact that we are using uh, this um, um, exponential is is making it uh, um, skewed to to a certain direction. It could be, uh, but um, it's the only way that we found that it it could train. Um, properly, and also we, we we not only did that, but we also had to clip at the two ends, at the lower and the higher end, because otherwise, at, at the very beginning, um, the network would try would get into very really bad local minima. So so you would find that it will reach um, negative time constants. So that would that would mean is that the network, um, well, and also really really large time constants. So, so so pretty much it would get out of the of the space of solutions that would actually be able to solve the problem. So we had to constrain that to 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 that space. Um, yeah, I think I think maybe that answers the, the question. I think so. Thank you. Um, so let's do two very quick ones. Um, so one is by Timo Wunderlich. Uh, to what extent could the training of time constants be replaced by random constant time constants with the same statistics as found after training? Yes. So so we actually try that and and. Maybe we should have included it. Um, but basically, what happens is that if you take the train time constants and you initialize a network with those time constants, but you randomly initialize the weights and you only train the weights, then it manages to get pretty much the same result as, a, as it got when it trained the, the, the time constants. It's not as good, um, probably because the initialization is far from what it needs to be. Um, but surprisingly, it, it, if I remember correctly, it performs pretty well in any case. Okay, thanks. Okay, now a short answer. It, it, well, is it, oh yeah, sorry. No, no, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I was saying that perhaps what they were referring, uh, uh, what he was referring about was what, what if I take that distribution and I sample from it uh, and then train. We haven't tried that, uh, I, I believe. Um, but yeah, it, it would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Okay, so last one, very quick one. Do you think the distribution of time constants would change depending on the level of recurrent connectivity in the network? Yes, I uh, think that it could. So our models are fully connected. Um, so everything is connected to everything. Um, and I think if you were to constrain things, uh, make the network larger uh, or and remove connections, it, it could happen. Definitely, I believe that what we will see if we make the network larger is that we see less large time constants in the distribution. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about what happens if we remove connections and we make some sort of sparse connectivity. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't predict exactly what would happen there. Uh, maybe even longer time constants because uh, you, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I'd rather not <laughs> uh, uh, speculate too much about what would happen. Okay, good. Well, thanks. This was, by the way, Rory Byrne who asked this question. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this nice talk. Thanks uh, Thank to you. all the speakers from this session again. I uh, will now have a 25 minute break and then, or that's basically a 20 uh, minute break by now. Um, and then we'll reconvene on Zoom this time for um, for the discussion, the panel discussion. And all speakers are invited there to, uh, to participate as panelists. So um, you should have all received the link. Uh, otherwise, uh, Worldwide Neuro is going to post it also in this chat. And with this, uh, thank you again for the talk. Thanks to all the speakers. And thanks for the great audience for all the questions. Thank you very much.